journey back in time with me to the 1920s. All the way back. Come on, all of us. I see a few people are stuck in the 60s. Come on, <laughs> lighten up. Pull all the way back to the 1920s. We're in the 1920s, and my father's in a one-room schoolhouse in West Virginia. And in that one room, there's two McGuffey readers. And he shares those readers with his classmate. And most of his time is spent memorizing data and information from those readers. Ten years later, so roll forward in time with me to the 1930s, and my grandfather now is laid off from the coal mines in West Virginia. He's replaced by a new machine called a joy loader. The joy loader can load as much coal as 100 men. And so now it's clear to everyone, including my grandfather, that machines are better at loading coal than men are. So imagine, if you will, a line, a line that separates machines from people. And on this side of the line are things that machines do better. And on this side of the line are things that people do better. It was clear to everyone, including my grandfather, that machines were now better at loading coal than people. So the line had moved. And now machines were much better at loading coal than people. And that line that separates people from machines was very wide and very black. And it was clear to everyone that no one was going to pay a man to load coal anymore. 1920s. You almost hear the Charleston, can't you, behind me? If this row would just do a little Charleston dance, it would really help. Thank you. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, hold on to your seats, because now we are going to the 60s, right? How is that for everyone? 60s? Okay. The music I hear in the back of my head are the doors. What do you hear? Shout it out. What do you hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here we are. Now I'm in school, but I'm not in a one-room schoolhouse, but I'm in school, and I spend much of my day, very much like my father did, memorizing data and information for a new thing in, in schools called standardized tests. Yeah. Meanwhile, my father's a logger now, and he's in Oregon, and his paycheck is now generated by a computer. His company has decided they're no longer going to pay a person to process the data and information for payroll anymore. So the line has moved again. Except now we have machines that are doing things that only people used to do in their heads. And so when we look at that line, it's getting smaller, thinner, and now a little grayer. Fast forward to the 1990s with me, huh? Remember that? Not that long ago, to me anyway. What music are you hearing in your head? Shout it out. Nirvana. Nirvana. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing Nirvana. And that's because I'm working for a large aerospace company in the Seattle area. And we're working on a new aircraft management system. And we're using expert system technology to capture human expertise and place it in that computer program. And so in one of our early meetings, one of my colleagues comes to the meeting and has this big computer printout, big stack. He just flops it on the table, throws up his arms, and he says, there it is, we have captured Phil the Navigator. And I looked across at Phil, and his face just went white. And I thought Phil must have felt very much like my grandfather when he lost his job to a machine. So I know what you're thinking. What happened to Phil? I can see it in your faces. You're concerned, right? Well, the story on Phil is he didn't really need to worry because we tried to move that line too far and too fast. We simply couldn't replace people with machines. When we field tested the system, the machine, the computer system, kept asking the humans for approvals to do stuff with the aircraft. And the crew, they look like pigeons pecking at those computer screens given those approvals. So when we saw that, we go, man, this is wrong, right? So we need to reimagine that computer system. And we did. We put people in charge, and we had the machines analyze data and information, supply it to the humans so they can make better decisions 
and make those decisions faster. So now the line had moved again. Now machines were analyzing data and information much better than people could. And that line that separates us from our machines, getting very thin and very gray. Come with me a little more in time to the 2000s. 10 years ago, what do you hear? Shout it out, what music? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear Dave Matthews. And now I'm a professor at a large public university in the Southwest. Hey, looks a lot like this place. <laughs> and I'm working with our scientists and engineers at our national laboratories in order to develop something new called knowledge management systems. And we created a system that would capture, store, and make available knowledge to these scientists and engineers so they could solve their problems. Having machines knowledge, manage our knowledge really changes the dynamic for human learning. Since all the humans can now see what's known about a problem or a subject, there's now a window of opportunity to do something new and innovative. This new paradigm of learning, innovative learning, really, really leverages massive amounts of data and information and now knowledge to accelerate human learning in a way we've never done before. So, when we think of that thin gray line, it's moved again. Because now machines are better at managing our knowledge than we are. And when we look at that line, very thin, hard to see. It's hard to know what machines do best compared to what we do best. Now, come to me with the future. The future? No. How about the present? Come to me into the present. And what do you hear? What music? All I hear is Taylor Swift <laughs> on all channels. <laughs> but that's part of living in the present, isn't it? So now I'm the dean of a school of education in a large university in the Midwest. My kids are in school. And what I've observed is they spend much of their educational experience memorizing data and information much like my father did in that one-room schoolhouse in West Virginia, now nearly 100 years ago. And furthermore, just as when no one would pay my grandfather to load coal anymore, no one will pay our kids for information that can be pulled up on an iPad. What they will pay... What they will pay our kids for is the ability to create new knowledge and share that knowledge. Okay, here's our call to action. Let's use this thin gray line that separates what machines can do best from what people can do best. Let's use that line to reimagine education. Let's reach across that line and grab our kids and pull them across to this side. And let's give them the opportunity to learn what people do best. And that's create new knowledge. Imagine their joy is they can work like real scientists and engineers, and they can access what's known about a topic, and they can add their creativity and their knowledge to it. If we allow them to do that, by definition, they will become innovators. Thank you.